Salutations and welcome to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm Alexander F., and today on the podcast, we are so excited to welcome member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, Frater Daniel Ist. Frater Ist joined the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, and he's also a part of the Solomonic Magic and Western Grimoire community, which is a main interest on the Glitch Bottle podcast. So in today's podcast, the show's first podcast, Frater Ist joins us to talk about magic in general, to help us debunk some of the Hollywood and pop culture takes on magic. And Frater Ist also is here to talk about what real magical practice could look like. It is not a cult. It is a cult. There is a difference. We do promise. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, I give you Frater Daniel Ist. Frater Daniel Ist, thank you so much for coming on the program today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So why don't we start with your early experiences with magic. I understand that probably like a lot of people in the West, because magic and Western magical practice isn't really that well known compared to some of the practices in the quote unquote Eastern uh, schools and Taoism and things like that. I understand that you actually started off learning about the Eastern traditions of magic. Can you talk a little bit about uh, growing up? Did you have any magical experiences? And then how did you get into the Eastern uh, school of magic? Growing up, I would definitely say you know, myself and you know my family and everything. We we definitely had uh, our share of paranormal experiences and uh spirituality was definitely important and whatnot i mean growing up in a fairly fairly religious home i would say and then there was a small period of time where it was definitely created kind of a void where uh you know spirituality just really wasn't there you know it wasn't really in the forefront of my mind and found you know a lot of the eastern traditions and everything uh much like many westerners and uh and also just like many westerners i had Lots of wonderful experiences and learned a lot of really wonderful things and it definitely launched me into some places I am now. But uh, I also ran into a lot of roadblocks, being that as I'm, I'm a Westerner and my psyche is geared to a certain style of doing things. But then I found, you know, traditions in the West. In a lot of ways, they're actually very similar. And, uh, but I, I, you know, I found, you know, Western magic and I... Uh, I learned very quickly that magic was not, you know, what Hollywood says it is and what, you know, your Sunday school teacher says it is or, uh, yeah, it's not exactly Harry Potter. <laughs> I can certainly agree with you that that's kind of how I approached it as well. Before I knew about hermetic magic or anything beyond just your casual reference to a Disney crystal ball or a Disney magic wand, I remember learning about Taoism and the Eastern traditions and Qi and meridians and all of these interesting things. And then kind of like you said, I slowly started to discover that the West, Western, you know, European traditions, Egyptian, Hermeticism, the Mediterranean area had this huge amount of history. Um, before we get into a little bit about what magic is, I thought you brought up a great point, uh, Frater Ist, about what magic is not. And perhaps we can talk about that a little bit first. Um, so I'll just ask you the question, since you are a uh, practicing magician. Are you sacrificing babies and are you doing things, you know, at midnight every night in, you know, cloistered halls with uh, devilish chants? And is that all magic is, was, and ever shall be? Well, of course. I mean, why else would anyone sign up for this? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Absolutely. <laughs> but, but no, in all serious, no, that's could not be further from the truth. Hollywood has such an interesting take. Of course, they have an interesting take on everything where it's commercialized and, and beefed up. But uh, And I, I've done a few videos on this where if you turn on a Hollywood film and something has to do with magic, it'll either be some 
person running through the woods being chased by a demon that they, you know, half-assed conjured out of a book. It'll be some vague reference to a crystal ball or, you know, satanic symbolism, which Christianity values really more than even magical practice. So, you know, can you talk a little bit about going forward when you see things like that, especially as a practicing magician, does that... Does it bother you at all when you see Hollywood totally getting it wrong? I mean, what are some of the some of the reactions going through your head? I don't necessarily get bothered per se. Cause, I mean, we do have to keep in mind that this is fiction, and they're more than welcome to take some artistic liberty and do their their job is to entertain. I, I don't get upset over that. Uh, although it is interesting how many people don't, aren't able to separate the fact that. This is fiction, what you're seeing. Can you tell us a little bit about, from your perspective, since we're, we're talking about what magic is not, it is not crazed teenagers running through the woods screaming from some kind of eerie devil. It is not uh, you know, a Disney wizard running their hands over a crystal ball and a butterfly appearing, for instance, although that would be certainly a very interesting thing to see in person. Um, can you talk about what is magic as far as your definition is because there are probably some people out there who are wondering what kind of magic you practice which we can talk about in, in a little bit but just in in general what is you know Frauderist's definition of magic what did, what does magic mean to you i would say magic is a very active approach to spirituality you know not that there's anything wrong with with passive ones i mean some th- people that's very fitting Myself, to a point, it it got me to some places, but I really needed something very active. And is a very active approach, as you know, Crowley put it. You know, it's combining the will with the imagination to produce a specific result. Ah, yes. Now you've done it. You've opened up the <laughs> Pandora's box of all magical practitioner discussions in the last hundred years for August, the the Crowley, Alistair Crowley. Good old Uncle Al. <laughs> well, un- Uncle Al certainly has his uh, moments. Sometimes uh, Uncle Al might knock on the door in a conversation, just like now, and now Uncle Al is in the picture. Um, but that is a great place to start. Um, you know, f- for yourself, Frater is when it, when it comes to magic being an active spiritual participation, can you talk about the role of Solomonic magic, the role of formalized ritual magic? Uh, if you're doing a ritual, whether it's a daily ritual or a full-on ritual, why is that important? Why is it important to approach magic in a ritualized context, to put a lot of effort, you know, pre-consecrating items, to pick the right day, the right hour, uh, why is it so important to approach things in a ritualized context as opposed to, say, you know, a, a very kind of sporadic or chaotic or impromptu uh, context? There's nothing wrong with that. But just to start there, why is that so important? Magic really is something very mechanical in a sense. You know, there is an A, there's a B, there's a C. You know, there's always – there's a process to things. Even if it seems a little more chaotic, there is a process to things. One thing has to happen for another, and then another, and another. It's a it's a step by step approach. You know, you can't just you can't just say I'm going to drive down to the store and expect to open up your back door and be at the store. So you're saying that the the ritualized components are necessary to provide some kind of structure during a ritual because if you are doing something kind of sporadic or without any guidance. It's kind of like throwing yourself into an ocean of uncertainty. I mean, the waves may toss you to and fro, whether it's uh, spiritual entities or your own mental state. In that way, does it kind of anchor a magician in a ritualized context? I would say it does. Um, you know, it's that ritualized approach allows you to sort of cover all your bases and all the different facets you need to produce the result of X being whatever that is, it, it produces results every time, if done correctly. When was your first successful magical, like Western magical experience? Do you, do you remember, can you talk about 
what were you doing? What were some of the things going through your head? Um, you know, just what was your first real uh, felt presence of direct experience, so to speak, with the either a spiritual being or, or some kind of magical uh, practice? Can you uh, can you share a little bit about that? Earlier on, I did start taking an interest in, like, say, like the Enochian system and whatnot of Dr. John Dee. Admittedly, I did not do it as by the book as I should have, but I started off by the book, and then I started to deviate, but then I started to notice that things were happening, and it actually kind of freaked me out because I wasn't sure if anything was going to happen. I kind of wanted it to happen, but I was – very early on, I was young, I was stupid, I was irresponsible, and then, you know, the atmosphere in the room changes, all of a sudden the lights are going out, and like, um, it wasn't like a bad presence at all, it wasn't like, you know, we can get into the side of the Goetia or anything like that, it wasn't like, necessarily like, you know, evil, it, but it was like, there was definitely, something was, there was some kind of shift taking place, and I didn't know that this was going to happen, so I started to deviate from this because like, I, I don't know if I should keep going, but I wanted to keep going. And then I was like, uh, and then things are just started to die off. How old were you? And did you have the actual full set of the Anakian tablets and the systems? Or did you just kind of haphazardly kind of just go about it? That That is fascinating that on your first real attempt, you, you got that kind of presence. Well, that's the thing. It was my first real attempt. <laughs> uh I did have some plenty of dry runs there. Um, I actually had someone print out some of uh, Anokian tablets for me. Um, they seemed to be okay. I mean, at least enough to something was happening. There it, it wasn't, you know, like what people say where they see, you know, that actual angel. But uh, there was definitely a presence, uh, definitely quite a bit of shift in, in atmosphere. There was just some you know, some physical phenomena that can, were was, was unexplained. There was also a bit of skepticism about it too i think that's why i, I kind of got a little freaked out <laughs> like i wanted something to happen but i also what well, i was skeptical and i also wasn't quite ready for all that <laughs> after that experience frater is how did that change how you approached magic did you um start to say okay i need to make some adjustments i need to approach this in a more mechanical way did you start to look at other grimoires as opposed to the Enochian system or, or other forms of magic as opposed to john d's system what what changed after that initial experience because i can imagine that for a lot of people especially if you're not used to magic um having that kind of experience uninvited or not must be a, a pretty big shock to someone for the first time so what were, what were your uh next steps so to speak I did start taking more precautions, whereas before I was kind of like flip over that, <laughs> you know, like let's just get down to the meat and potatoes of this. I, I, I did take more precautions when I started to working with like Goetta experience. I did take a little more precaution because I was like, I don't exactly want to uh, have some, you know, demon have some foothold when I, you know, I should be going by the book. So I have this thing bound, but I... First time I did cut corners, and I mean, luck, luckily nothing happened. Uh, I did. Uh, I, I actually, uh, I actually cleansed my place after that and banished and everything just to make sure. When you interact with these beings, what is the purpose of magic? What is the drive that you have to experience and to practice Western magic, whether it's Solomonic magic, whether it's, you know, specifically working within another system that, that we can get into later on. What, what, why do you do it? What's, what's the point aside from just the awesome experience of encountering these beings, which might be reason enough, but what is the attraction, the draw that you feel when it comes to engaging in these magical practices? My spiritual development, I think, is always first and foremost in this. But there's a result in mind. I know I've heard of people summon a Goetia spirit then just to have it there, but then it's like they don't want to tell what they want to do for them. That's, to me, a little ridiculous. You got it there. You might as well just, you know, do both of you a favor and, <laughs> and just tell it uh, what you need it for. I would say there's a – spiritual development is like first and foremost, but there's there is also some um, – some underlying, you know, personal things too. I mean, you can use high magic for, I mean, low magic works a little bit better for your more immediate mundane needs. 
some of the listeners out there might not know the difference between high magic or low magic. Can you, Daniel, just kind of give your own definition of when you say high magic, what are you specifically referencing versus, say, low, quote-unquote, magic? Can you? What's kind of the difference between the two? Oh, I do want to first uh, say that it's not a difference of which is better. It's a different set of tools. High magic is dealing with you know, just that kind of higher beings, higher states of consciousness, of energy. It deals with more ascent, enlightenment, things of this nature. Uh, low magic is more about, you know, like working with like lower spirits, like your own oh, nature spirits or even could be in there or, uh, you know, just working with manifesting your, you know, immediate mundane needs. Um, high magic is generally more your, your ceremonial style magic. Low magic is more... Uh, more your folk magic. Well, Daniel, I think now is a good time to talk about uh, the Pandora's box that you had to open earlier, which would be the box of Aleister Crowley and the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Where do you want me to begin? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we should say on the outset that you are a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, Frater Ist. I am not mm -hmm. a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. I, I know yourself and others. I uh, am more of an independent Solomonic magic uh, individual, but I have certainly a lot of... Uh, interest from some of the listeners and from some of the authors that you see out there are part of this group called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. If you were to give a 30-second definition of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn to someone on the street who maybe heard a little bit about it and a little bit about this Crowley character, what would you say to them? What is this group all about? The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is part of the Rosicrucian tradition. Um, it is therefore primarily when it comes to the magic involved, primarily at least uh, uses astrological magic. It really is about, you know, the, your energetic development, like you might see in uh, Taoism and Tantra, things of that nature. The magic involved doesn't really get into the manifestation of your knees necessarily, although you can. Some of the things that involve you most certainly can use it for that, although you should not ever make that its primary focus. You know, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn has produced some of the world's most famous magicians since 1888. I'm not saying every one of them. There are many that are very famous, very well respected, who I have a lot of respect for, who I think are great, who have never been members and won't ever be members, and that's fine. I need to get that out there. Uh, I first actually heard about it actually pretty early on when I started getting into the Western tradition. Um, not quite knowing how to even get into it or even if it would be for me or if it was, I figured you have to be a pretty advanced, you know, pretty well-known magician to get involved in this. And now just I, then I come to find out that's really not the case. You, 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 uh, they'll take you as is, however that, and they, they'll take, they'll work with you wherever you are at your entrance. From someone on the outside's perspective, like myself, it's such an interesting yet a, almost a polarizing force. You know, you either really enjoy and are pro Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, or so many people might have some issues with it, or some imagined or otherwise issues with the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. But for you, it sounds like this this organization has really benefited you as you said your, your spiritual development is first and foremost so can you talk about just what what were some of the benefits um that you got from the Her and continue to get from the hermetic order of the golden dawn is it a combination of, of magical and fraternal and spiritual development i mean what are some of the different factors going on for you magically uh and otherwise as a member of the organization like i said my spiritual Development is first and foremost, which it definitely – it's hard to really explain if you're not a member or have never been a member, but definitely supercharges that. I would say it's very much helped me you know, with my magic and really giving me some tools needed and you know, whatever my magical approach may be. Many of us do practice you know, several different forms of magic. It really kind of gives you this, uh, you know, this ability to, uh, you know, like I said, just kind of supercharge that. It is not primarily a fraternity. Just get that out of there. 
it's not primarily ever yes it is yes there is a very strong very wonderful very beautiful fraternal side that's extremely important but it's not primarily a fraternity in fact it actually acts as a more collegiate system that kind of goes along with some of the misconceptions that people might have of the group and again i'm, I'm not a member of the group but people who are outside of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn or people who might have a more antagonistic view might say things like, and, and maybe we can kind of go down the list, um, this is like Tom Cruise and Eyes Wide Shut. It's just a bunch of people in these cloaks and hoods chanting things on a checkered floor with some kind of Illuminati Masonic God connection. Fraterist, is this the case? Is this is this what you do? <laughs> well, like I've said before... Uh... If this wasn't, why did I even sign up? <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> this is not the case. Um, certainly there is regalia, there's tools involved, but these are two. I'll put it this way. you What's done in ritual there has to be impressive to all to all your senses. It has to impress all your senses. It, also has, to, it has symbolism to all your senses and as meaning to, to all your senses. It's just completely just sinks into every part of your being. That's why it's done the way it is. Um, no, it is not part of the Bavarian Illuminati. No, it is not masonry. Yes, the three principal founders were masons. Yes, many, many people involved, and myself included, are masons. But no, it is not masonry. There is definitely some some symbolism there that was kind of borrowed and whatnot, and some structure, but it, it's not, and it's never claimed to be masonry. It sounds like the Golden Dawn, like many other grimoireic practices, does have a system, and that system includes methodical steps, the required equipment, things like that. It sounds like that there are at least some similarities in that regard. Would that be a fair assessment? Oh, yeah. No, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head with that. And it is worth pointing out that uh, the sort of grimoireic tradition is part of the integral part of the Golden Dawn tradition. It is worth pointing that out, too. Not quite in the same way as a puritism might practice it, but it is very much a part of it. Not necessarily right away, but you do get into it. When the Golden Dawn comes up in, in magical discussion, one of the most common things I might hear is how people who are outside of the Golden Dawn might say, well, the Golden Dawn has this thing about vibrating words and you know really getting into it and, and humming words in a certain way and i don't need to do that if i'm doing a magical practice if i'm conjuring uh with the goetia or the heptameron i i don't need to do that and i can just kind of get into my own rhythm maybe it's just barely a whisper can you talk about the whole issue of vibratory incantations and vibration because i think a lot of people outside of the golden dawn might have either a misconception about it or they might assume that that everything is done the same way if it works it works so if it works for you to not vibrate a name and you get your, the result you need then that's fine you know if it works it works this is my opinion on it at least i'm not speaking i mean i would need to point out i'm not speaking on behalf of the golden dawn in this interview <laughs> The importance of vibration, vibrating like God names and everything, well, like I said before, it is a school of, you know, energetic development. And as we see, say, similarly, similar to into the East, how they vibrate names and do their, their ohms and everything, similar to that. It, it is to sort of awaken something inside of you as well as outside of you when you're invoking when you're using vibration in that way, it, does the vibration in the Golden Dawn system have to be in a certain a certain note, a certain tone? Do you do you have to hold things for a certain amount of time, or is there is there ability to kind of tailor and really cater to the individual practitioner, the individual magician? Oh, certainly. I mean, uh, you know, I've I've heard people vibrate. You know, names in completely different ways that I would do it is still the same name that they're vibrating. They're still vibrating it, but they're, they sound completely different than me. Say, for example, if someone was a musician, they're going to sound completely different from me who is not. Your will and your intention are such huge, huge, oftentimes overlooked magical implements. These are so important. Daniel, I think you touched on a really important point here, which is... 
intention and will. Can you just talk about about that? Because I think some people might be out there who might say, well, I have all the implements. I you know, went to the farthest reaches of the world, and I got a, a, a black ebony wand that I cut myself from a tree in Africa, and I found a lion's belt that I, I hunted down a lion, and I do not condone hunting any lions, exotic beasts, animals, just throwing that out there. But it, let's say that someone d- did all that. Can you talk about the importance of the will when you are, say, standing in a circle, you're about to start a ritual, uh, even if you have all the perfect implements and celestial uh, holy implements and tools why is will so important in a magical ritual what does will do you can have all these cool tools all this fun regalia all you can have decor around your ritual space you can have all you know the incense going but if what's going on internally isn't there this is going to mean nothing you need to have that internal spark so to speak it is your will that say you woke up this morning and to, you know, your alarm goes off and you rolled out of bed. It's your will, you know, your intention. You're doing these mundane tasks. It's kind of like that. But then you think about it at a more macrocosmic level. Absolutely. And if you'll permit me, it, while you were speaking, it kind of triggered uh, something I read in the sacred book of Abramel and the Mage, which uh, is very, very important. Uh, 1300s AD uh, story and, and step by step self initiation into the holy guardian angel, where the author of the uh, grimoire, Abraham of Worms, uh, in Germany, mentions that it's so important to pray from the heart and he's in a letter to his son he says you may ask me son father why don't you write out for me the form and words of the prayer how i should pray because i'm not smart enough to do this for myself and he says my son listen if you cannot pray you'll have problems don't even try to begin this do not repeat prayers without thought or devotion prayers must come from the whole heart with attention and understanding so he's kind of saying even in the sacred book of abramel and the mage that if you don't, if, if you're not inflamed, and we kind of hear this a lot, inflame thyself with prayer, inflame thyself with intentionality. If you don't have that, the magical ritual, the magical practice might be, you might get either partial results or no results. Would that be fair? The external definitely plays an important part, but I, I would say that that internal, you know, kind of divine spark is really what makes it happen. Frater is as we. Come to the end of this podcast, there might be some listeners out there who are wondering, how do I get started? Not even in necessarily in the Golden Dawn, but just in magic in general, what advice would you have for people who are curious, who want to get started in magical practice, Western, Grimoireic, Solomonic magic? How should they begin? What should they start doing? And what advice would you have for them? Really, I would say on a very practical level, just begin Find what's what's pulling your heartstrings. Find that and go into that. I'm not saying day one draw a circle and summon the demonic kings. I'm not saying that. I, what I am saying is find what where you feel like you're being drawn to. Get all the information you can. All the you know get involved with people and get involved in the community start gathering tools just do anything you need to do to just begin you know just get yourself into the state which you can be doing this whatever that takes you know just just begin it's that simple so stop staring at the pool from afar just put on your swimming suit and literally just get soaked in something make sure you're safe make sure that you're you're taking your time in it but just jump in sure Like, like i said don't Day one, don't draw a circle and summon the demonic kings. I am saying, yeah, you know, there some things definitely take some uh, some preparation, but just find what what you want to do, learn about it, just do it, just get into it, and just do your magic, you know, three hundred percent, just do it. But yeah, take absolutely take your time. I, I say jump in, but then I say take your time. I know it sounds a little strange. <laughs> if you feel like you need to take your time before actually beginning. A ritual that's fine you know you need to be comfortable in what you're doing but just begin crack open a book you know go online and start listening to 
to what you know these very advanced magicians have to say. You know, start seeing what you need to do to do whatever it is you want to do, and just get to it. You know, magic is very active. Very few Solomonic or Enochian or Goetic spirits were ever engaged with from the sidelines, from kind of a, a half-assed uh, per- perspective, <laughs> so to speak. I say you wanted to strictly be involved with the Goetia, that's fine. Um, but yeah, like, again, things like that, you, you, there's some different preparation involved. So really read through it front, front and back, know it, get it down. Like some of the more intense grimoires, you're gonna want it, but get it down and as part of your preparation obviously but even that is beginning very wise words frater daniel ist and certainly words that are echoed in the best of the grimoires and the book of abramelin and elsewhere uh, frater daniel ist thank you so much for coming on the podcast and helping us uncork the uncommon today thank you for having me it's been my pleasure And thank you for listening to this episode of the Glitch Bottle Podcast and helping us uncork the uncommon this fine day or night or wherever you happen to occupy space-time in your occult lairs, your summoning towers, or your cloistered libraries of the esoterically awesome. You can check out previous episodes and other magical Glitch Bottle news on YouTube, youtube.com slash glitchbottle, and you can download episodes on our blog, glitchbottle.blogspot.com. Please make sure also to subscribe and follow us on YouTube. And also you can follow us on Twitter at GlitchBottle, all one word. Our intro music is the track Tornado by David Zeste. Our magical interest is fueled by sincerity, passion, amazing guests, and a copious amount of clinking coffee cups. Until next time, this is Alexander F. reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light. Keep the light.